cast for magic. We come to the Pope on Film podcast to laugh, to cry, to care, because we need that. All of us. That indescribable feeling we get, which I'm describing literally right now. So how describable are we talking about here? That indescribable feeling we get when the Liz a Day theme song begins to play and we go somewhere we've never been before. Not just entertained, but somehow reborn. <laughs> Dazzling images on a small Twitch stream, stream, sound that is sound, somehow, Amaland horse erotica feels good in a podcast like this. Bunny Williams feels like the stoned parts of us, and May Lynn feels perfect and powerful because here they are. The Pope on Film podcast. We make movies better. Welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is I am the Pope in question. My name is Reverend Maylin. I am the founder of the Church of Ed Wood, which is an actual thing worth a Google. This is episode four eighty four of the podcast. And Bunny, I'm just going to tell you this right now. I am suffering from extreme insomnia. I have had four hours of sleep, but I still woke up early, went to church, fed my kids, finished writing the podcast, and I'm now recording the podcast because I'm a freaking professional. <laughs> but I'm also, like, right on the edge. So I'm really excited to record this episode so that I can then pass the F out. But just to let you know, I'm not 100% right now. Yeah. I am freaking exhausted. But anyway, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pope on Film. The final season. Yes. The final season of this beloved, long-running, and seldom podcast. The Autumn Years. The Quiet Time. And now, the end is near. Although, that's too old now. I assume people have moved on. Now, I guess it would be, it's something unpredictable. But in the end, it's right. Yeah. Like uh, like uh, that cheesy thing at the end of Deadpool and Wolverine. So if you count this episode, we have roughly five episodes left, and I figured after this episode, I'll pick the next movie, and after that, you can finish us off, give us a happy ending, with the last uh, four episodes being, well, three, being all you. This whole podcast is coming to a close soon, and so, as per the ironclad contract that I signed in 2014, 
I have been busy these last two weeks packing things up at the old Fun Film Studios here in beautiful, sunny downtown Kent, Ohio. I've been busy packing up our movie library, our collection of vintage movie posters, freeing the Oompa Loompas we had locked in the basement, reclawing the cats, which is very difficult. Declawing, that's easy. I can do that for, you know, 10 bucks, a bottle of Jack, and no questions asked. But reclawing cats, that's difficult. And also, for the good of society, burning our, burning our mountains and mountains of Rayma land horse erotica. Because it's for the best, Bunny. Yes. The planet's not ready for our uh, pages and pages of Ray Maland horse erotica. However, we have five episodes left, including this episode, so let's get right to the news. Buddy! Yes! Chick-fil-A is starting a streaming service. I, I have heard of this. Chick-fil-A is starting a freaking streaming service, which I think is ridiculous. Um, but I'm also kind of excited for it because finally we are one step closer to the gritty grimace origin story that we have all been waiting for. Yes, this is true. There, there's some positives to the idea of just everyone getting a streaming service. I mean, if Mr. Lobo and Cinema Insomnia has a streaming service then I guess Chick-fil-A isn't that far Yeah, away but from like, the realm what of... is it going to be? They have, I mean, McDonald's, yeah, they have the Grimace, they have Mayor McCheese, they have the Hamburglar. The fuck does Chick-fil-A have? I would like to see, like, gritty reboots of all the McDonald's characters. Mayor McCheese can have a House of Cards type show. And, uh, uh, the Hamburglar, Breaking Bad. Boom. Yeah. I'd be fine with that. Here's the thing, though. I was thinking Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A having a streaming service. When the world, when the world would, would that be? Just some white guy screaming, you're not gay, into the camera? I don't know what Chick-fil-A yeah. would. But then it hit me. I would see a show about those fucking cows. Yeah. It's really weird that there's a chicken fast food franchise whose mascot, whose mascots are cows desperate to stay alive. Yeah. I always found that to be fucking weird. So if they are able to put together a show that actually explains that, I would watch that. Now, what other restaurants could you see? Besides McDonald's, what other restaurants could you see uh, doing a streaming service? I I would like to see Captain D's. Captain D's? Is that a sub place? No, it's a fish place. It's a fish place. It's, okay. it's basically Long John Silver's. Gotcha. Freaking so Long yeah, John's I, I would want to see a drunk, most likely smelly fishing boat captain doing a show. Yeah, yeah. I, I want the behind the scenes at Captain D's. Maybe if every streaming, if every fast food franchise does get a streaming service, I would like to see a prequel focused on Carl Sr. Yeah. Yeah. There's the you thought. Know, what happened in Carl Sr.'s life that Carl Jr. is like, I'm going to spend my life making food that's the 30th most popular food in America. You know? Yeah. I would like to see that. I don't think Chipotle is ever going to have a streaming service because I don't think the technology is just right 
to be able to turn on a streaming service that gives you the shits. Yeah. And let me tell you something. I know one restaurant that is not getting a streaming service, Subway, because they will absolutely not be able to show any kids programming. True. Because your mind will immediately go to Jared. True. But I would really a- like to see Wendy's, Wendy's OnlyFans. Heck yeah. Like, we'll be able to see some feet pics from Wendy's. I'd be down with that. Bunny, uh, in other news, uh, I've been really successful lately. I just booked a commercial. Really? Yeah, it's for J.D. Wentworth. He's coming back. You know, I have a structured settlement and I need cash now. Well, J.D. Wentworth, A77 Cash Now. I'm a little bit worried about it, though. We will be filming the commercial at Arlington National Cemetery. Oh. And I asked J.D. Wentworth, um, I'm like, hey, should we be filming in Arlington National Cemetery? I thought that was a felony. And they said, yeah, uh, it is, but I'm sure we'll be fine. Yeah. So a little bit worried about that, but I'm excited to have booked a commercial. I've got a great idea for a play, but Okay. Great idea for a play. Kind of like um, the General yeah. Grant cooking cooking book yes. that you were going to write uh, a play on? Yeah. So so I've got a great idea for a play. It's kind of like Grease. Okay, it's very much like Grease. Okay, it's just Grease. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. All of the... Okay, so you do Grease the normal way. But when it comes to singing, every single solitary cast member sings like the guy from the B-52s. Ah. Because I was thinking, I hate Grease, but how could you do Grease in a way I would be okay watching it? You do it very serious, right down the board, exactly how it's supposed to be. But then when it's time to do a song, Summer Lovin'. Have me a blast! Yeah, I do. I would. I'd watch that twice. Yeah, and I think that that could open up an entire thing. You do twelve Angry Men, but everyone's doing a Christopher Walken impression. Yeah, I would also. I'd watch that three times. I have always wanted. When it comes to Greece, I have Ooh. always wanted to see a version of Greece where, as it's as you're watching it. A random cast member spontaneously combusts. Ooh, okay. I'd be down with that. I want to do Bye Bye Greasy from just the like, last season of like, whole movies. What, what do you think, Rizzo? And you look over, and Rizzo just exploded. I would be all. I would be all right with that. Just put, just put two landmines on the set. Yeah. That would be exciting. That's something that they probably do in the Battle Royale universe. Yes. So, Bunny, I saw a movie in theaters this past week. I saw the psychological horror thriller drama Blink Twice, starring okay. Channing Tatum, or as my wife likes to call him, Channing Chatham. It, it, I saw the preview like twice and it gave me a bit of Midsommar vibes like, oh, here's this billionaire. He owns an island. He's inviting people to come party with them. Everything's fine. How many days have we been here? I don't know. But I love it. I'm having such a great time. Everything's great. But then things start happening. And I'm like, okay, well, this might be interesting. Here's the first warning for you. There's a trigger warning before the credits roll. Okay. Informing you that a good portion of this movie has to deal with sexual assault. The twist of this 
is all sexual assault. And it's really fucked up. And there's a part of the movie that's just, <laughs> that's kind of messed up because when eventually when you realize the twist, it's really fucked up. And there's a, there's a Epstein niche to the movie that they don't let you know in the previews. You know, like when normal people say, hey, I'm going to go see this movie. The previews look great. And then they go to the movie and they're like, oh, fuck, it's a musical. They didn't yeah. tell me that in the preview. Well, Blink Twice, the m main plot of it has to do with uh, abusing women. And it's, it's, it's fucked up. And they should inform people about that before you sit down and buy a before ticket. Before you buy a ticket, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of fucked up. But I did like it. You know, when it comes to movies where women are ard, the revenge has to really kick ass. Yeah. And once you realize that the R is what's going on, the revenge does come pretty quick after that, and it's pretty kick ass, and I like that. You know yeah, who was yeah, in the movie? Like, well, I mean, but that's what I just don't like about revenge movies in general, like yes. Last House on the Left or I Spit on yep. the Grave. I mean, yep. yes, to get that to that end is very satisfying. You know, but, but the fucking muck you have to crawl through to get there. Yeah. You like know, Andy I'd, I'd rather not. Yeah. But the movie crazy ass cast. Channing Tatum, Kyle McLaughlin, um, Christian Slater, Gina Davis. She's still alive. I don't know when the Yeah, I don't know when the last time was I saw Gina freaking Davis in something. It that blew my mind. Holy shit, Gina Davis is in this. She looked good. She was acting great. She was Gina Davis. Wait, wait, wait a second. No, no, no. You can't say those two things okay. in the same breath. She was acting fine. Okay, she was okay, acting as better. Gina Davis Lee as you ever expect Gina Davis to act. Yes. But I was really surprised. It, it, it was a good movie, but everyone needs to be warned about what this movie is really about. It's kind of fucked up. Yes. It's like seeing, like when I saw the previews for, uh, Tim Burton, Sweeney Todd, and it's like, fuck, they're not letting anyone know this is a musical. People are going to get fucked. It, there are some women who will go and see uh, the movie Blink Twice only because Channing Tatum's in it and he's hot, and then they're going to get absolutely effed in the A by what this movie is really about. And so I just want to warn people uh, the trigger warning should be even before you decide to pay a ticket for this movie. Yeah. And, Bunny, there is, of course, my personal life. I have had a busy week. Oh, I have a, I have a busy week coming up. So today i got to record the podcast. And then on Tuesday, I'm taking Eleanor out for a special thing. And then on Wednesday night, I have one of my biggest shows of the year. Yeah. A college. That's uh, East Central University in Ada, Oklahoma. It's kind of a cool college town. Here in Oklahoma, and I performed there last November as part of a drag show, and I made such an impression on them that the college has invited me back, not the drag show, just me, and I feel kind of good about that. So I'm doing my own uh, one-woman show this Wednesday night, and tickets are $5 if you're not a student, but if you're a student or a or a teacher or a faculty member and you have a valid ID you get in for free and they specifically scheduled my show when classes are happening and so it's this Wednesday night and I'm hearing from a bunch of people it, it's going to be a, a packed show, a big show, a great show I'm super excited and then the next day on Thursday I have a super important meeting and then on Saturday I'm performing at a Latin Pride event which makes sense, because as you know, Bunny, yeah. I care so much about my culture. Yes, you do. Representation matters. And so I am such a Hispanic. Oh, wait, that's it. I did the uh, Italian. I did 
a hand gesture, but it's more Italian. But uh, yeah, I'm 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 really successful right now. Sure, Bunny, I'm I'm super successful. I'm going places, rising star like Michael Florwax. But you know what? I'm just so humble about it. Which is which is which of course is what you love about me. Oh, of course. There's one thing that you love about me, it's how super humble I'm being. Despite being so successful. I'm not letting the success get to me, Bunny. I'm still I'm still Jenny from the block. Yeah. True. I haven't changed. And I'm using my newfound success to give back, Bunny. I'm not sure if you realize this. I just opened a school. Did you? Yes, I opened a school in a very poor, very neglected nation called, hold on, I wrote it down, Sacramentos. Oh. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Sacramentos. So have you gotten your passport? <clears throat> yes, in fact, in the early 2000s, <laughs> I was a missionary who was sent to this sad war torn nation yes of sacramento and at first of course the uh primitive the natives in sacramento were uh, they were hesitant of the newcomer and that was to be expected but i jane good all that shit i stayed there stayed in the trees with binoculars you know studying the sacramentosians and eventually the primitives of sacramento yeah. They made me their chiefess. Aha. Uh -huh. So I was really I was really brought in. And I wanted to give back to that community is what my publicist told me to say. And so I recently broke ground on a new school there because if there's one thing that I learned from my time as a Sacramentosian, it's that there is a big homelessness problem there. A huge homelessness problem. Uh, you go to their downtown, you go to their town square, it, you, it, you see so many, a lot, I mean a lot of poor, sad, homeless llamas just wander the streets. They never get a chance to, to have an education. Because I feel that all llamas should, should have the chance to go to school. And so this is this is how you get there. Just broke ground. We're building at a rapid rate. We're very excited. So this is how you get there. So you go to Sacramento. You go downtown to their little town square, you know, yeah. to their gazebo. And you go to the Johnny Rockets. Not that Johnny Rockets, the other Johnny Rockets. Oh, of course. No, 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 not that one. The other, other one. Oh, nobody goes to the other one. No, you go to the other, other, other Johnny Rockets in downtown Sacramento. And then this is what you do. You take a... Uh, are you, are you starting a school or are you selling crack? No, I'm starting a school, Bunny. Okay. So you go to the other, other, other Johnny Rockets in Sacramento. The, the, the and crack then, Johnny Rockets. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. But then, but that's not where the school is. You get there, and then you take Las Palmas, take Las Palmas to Colorado, take Colorado down to Pico, and that's how you get to the Lama School. Simple as that. Okay. That took a really long time to get to a pretty uh, buddy. Can you? Your camera just went out. Okay, you can still hear me, though? I can still hear you. Okay, let me see what I can do about this freaking camera situation. Dang it. Uh, okay, so there I am. I mean, there you are. Where's my freaking camera? Uh, start video. Dang there on. you go. Okay. Dang it! Okay, let me try again. Then you touch start something. Video. There you go. Okay, we're good. We're good. All right. We're good. We're good. But still, despite all of my sass, success and my accolades, I'm still laser focused on this podcast, funny, because the world's eyes and ears and uh, pancreases are on this podcast, funny. Yes. And with our unique 
blend of laughter and tears, I'm certain that when the historians finally get around to writing their textbooks, that the ending of the Pope on film will go down as one of the most influential moments of American history. Oh, it's it, it, it's going to get more viewers than MASH. Yeah, because I think that like when the historians are like, what are the most important things in American history? I would say number one, of course, would be Magic Johnson's cameo in the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. Number two, of course, would be Benghazi. What did Hillary Clinton know? Yeah. Number three would would be the Pope on Film end. You yes. know, finally, after a decade, the Pope on Film podcast, everyone's favorite podcast that they've never heard of is ending. And number nine, I guess, would be, I don't fucking know, 9-11. I yeah. guess. No, wait. Number, okay, number four would be the Humpty Dance. All right, stop the what you're doing, because I'm about to ruin the image and the style that you used to. I look funny. But you want making money, see? So your world, I hope you're ready for me. So gather round. I'm the new fool in town, and my sound's laid down by the underground. I drink up all the Hennessy you've got in your shelf, so just let me introduce myself. My name is May Lynn. <laughs> I know more of the Humpty Dance than I thought. Okay, so number four would be the Humpty Dance, and number five can be fucking 9-11. No, wait. Number five should be the release of the Star Wars candy where the popsicle is Jar Jar's mouth. You remember that? Yeah. And so you so like in order to eat a candy, you've got to make out with the worst Star Wars character. George yeah. Lucas okayed this. I find that fascinating. And now people are like, oh, okay, okay, life. okay, 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 yeah. Worst Star Wars character, but best fucking lover. Of course. Of course. And Face it. And, making out with Jar Jar to get candy wasn't that bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, hey, I've had weirder Friday nights. So, number five would be the release of the Star Wars candy where you're French kissing Jar Jar Binks. Actually, number five will be a tie between the release of the Star Wars candy where you're making out with Jar Jar Binks and that one vine. Ten minute warning. Ten minute warning. And that one vine, you know what I'm talking about? I'm in my mom's car. Vroom, vroom. Get out me car. So, so, both of those would be number five. Number six is going to be uh, 9-11. Oh, wait. Scott Steiner's math promo from WCW. Okay, so that's six. <laughs> the greatest the greatest wrestling promo of all time, because Scott Steiner is like a freaking idiot and doesn't know math. So okay. number six. No, there's got to be Go-Go Power Presidente. Oh, yes. Well, that's that has to be seven, so 9-11 no, can't be seven. Uh, actually, number seven is also going to be a tie, because number seven is going to be Go, go, para presidente. And the time bunny, when you went viral, having gone to a protest, and while everyone else has big, huge signs, you have a small whiteboard that read, just don't. That, of course, went viral, and you ended up becoming like America's guy standing in front of the tanks at Tiananmen yes. Square. Yes, just I don't. am Greta Thunberg. Yeah. Yeah, just don't sweat the nation. It was the opposite of Nike. Just do it. Eh, just don't. Just don't. So number eight will have to be uh, 9-11. Fuck. Okay, never mind. Albert B. Fall and the Teapot Dome scandal yeah. has to be eight. It has to be on the list. So number nine will be, it can't be, it can't, 9-11 can't be number nine because that has to be the season finale of Newhart. That was a big fucking deal. Yeah. Big ass deal. And you know, Bonnie, I tried really hard to get to book 
Suzanne Plachette for our last episode. Yeah. But apparently she went and died, which I think is fucking rude. Rude ass. She she did? Yeah. Yeah, she died. So, like, damn. She, I'm pretty sure she died just so that she wouldn't have to be on the podcast, which I didn't think is, which I don't think is cool. That's but rude. that's that's but really rude. eight months ago, Bunny, I started talking to Bob Newhart's publicist, and barring any unforeseen circumstances, Newhart's a lock for the finale. Yes. Uh huh. I mean, as as long as no nothing happens. From now until then, with Bob you know, I haven't really been paying attention yeah. to the news, but I'm sure everything's fine. Bob Newhart, final episode. It, you know, get your get your tickets now. So that has to be number nine. So number ten will be nine eleven. No, number ten is the opening of America's first Dan Flashes. It's a clothing store. The patterns are very complicated. Yeah. So a book. 9-11 is number 11. That's convenient. I, mm. I planned that whole thing. It, it's perfect. You love it. It's amazing. So that's the list. We're number three on the list of the 11 most important things to ever happen. In America. Yeah. I'm okay with 9-11 being in 11th place because, like, who even, who, even, who even knows when that happened? Yeah. Who even knows when 9-11 happened? 9-11 is serious, though, and you can't joke about it, which is why I have to publicly denounce the rap group Public Enemy for their song, 9-11 is a joke. <laughs> How could you? How could you make fun of 9-11 like that? <clears throat> Not cool, Flava Flav. So anyway, I wrote that when I was very energetic and it had um, enough sleep. Uh-huh. And I'm so happy that I wrote all that out because I am fucking exhausted. I am downing coffee and soda just to stay awake for this episode because I'm really suffering from insomnia. Oh, but so what's this about what's this about next week's show? We we were either okay, doing okay. it next yes, week or yes, 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 yes. Okay. Let's talk about that. Because uh, we're still doing every other week for the podcast. But two weeks from now is Q and Maxwell's birthday. Yeah. And uh, I talked it over with them. They absolutely, positively, 100% will not allow me to record the podcast on their birthday. Okay. So we can either do it on the 8th, which is a week from now, or we wait until the 20th. Second, which is three weeks from today. Either way, I still want to stay on our schedule. So uh, I have an episode scheduled for the 29th. So it's either we do an episode next week or we do two episodes on the 22nd and 29th at the end of the month. It's up to you. We will prob we will either way, we will end up doing Two back-to-back episodes. Yeah, but week. but but see, I'm also looking at October sixth there, and that would be the perfect last show. Oh, okay. I thought this was going to be the fifth episode, but fuck it. Okay, so because that that is the actual date we started. It was my birthday. Okay, October then how 6th. about this? How about this? We do. Two more episodes on the 22nd of September and then the 6th of October. Okay. You down with that? So we're doing this episode, then the 22nd, and then, then, and the then we finish it up on the 6th. Okay. You down with that? Okay, yes. Okay, do you want to pick the next two movies then? Uh, no, I'll just pick the last one. Okay, then I'll pick the next one, because and that's good, because I already have something planned. So, okay, two more episodes left. This is the last, this is the third to last episode. Yes. This is exciting. This is thrilling. Join us on the shocking season finale. 
series finale of the Pope on Film podcast. Who will live? Who will die? Who knows? Yes. Very exciting. But that is coming up in the weeks to come. Uh, right now, what we need to do, we need to take a break and we need to talk about this week's movie, which... Bunny, I will need your help because... I don't know Buffy the fucking Vampire Slayer. Oh, you don't need to know a lot about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but... But I do know a lot about being trans, and I feel that I... It kind of feels weird saying this, but I feel like this movie is for trans people. <laughs> I, this is a trans allegory for trans people, and so I hoped you liked it. If you didn't, eh, it's too bad. It's kind of not for you. No, I like this movie. I like this movie quite okay. a lot. I, 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 yeah, but let's get to that after the break. Maybe we should take a break. Should we take a break? We should take a break. I concur. We will be right back with more of the Pope on Film podcast after this. Do, 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 do. This is the outro. Do, 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 do. It's an original song. I wrote it myself. Yes. And then Johnny Carson stole it from me, went back in time and stole the piece. And I don't think that that's okay. I'm thinking of going back in time and suing him, but that gets complicated. Do, 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 and cut. Great. Montage. 
montage, disco montage. It's a montage. We're cleaning up the streets. We're getting people with wife beaters, asking them questions in an alleyway. I'm wearing a peach colored suit and everything's cool. It's a montage, a disco montage. Is that a jeepney? That's weird. It's a montage. Here's my business card. It's a montage. A disco montage. We are cleaning up the streets. We're whacking the attack. And sometimes we're attacking the whack. And sometimes it's a whack attack. Because we don't have a coherent catchphrase yet for what we are doing. Maybe we should get some better publicity. Maybe hire somebody to do this stuff to figure out what we should call this. Maybe we can do that in our montage. Kung Fu montage. We're talking to drunk people. That might... I think that's MC Hammer now. MC Hammer's drunk. He is drunk in a hallway. We're walking past pawn shops in our montage. A kung fu montage. Disco godfather and a guy with an afro. A really impressive afro in a montage. Walking down to something. Not really steps, but maybe that is a thing. And this guy's got a briefcase. And he's got his at a pipe. Uh, I don't know what he's doing. He's signing a piece of paper. In a montage, Smokey the Bear montage. They are walking down the streets with some fine ladies. In a montage, beating up random people that they see on the street. Got real big glasses. See somebody beating up people, doing real bad kung fu. Getting some guy, grabbing him by the sweater. Slapping him across the face, his sweaty face in a montage. I've got a dog montage. A one, two, three, four. You look so pretty next to somebody else. I'll tell you, I'll just tell you.
Huh, look at this. Certified frustration free packaging. Hmm. Not not frustrating, that's good. I guess I just pull here and uh Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. These are some of my favorite worst posts from the last few weeks on the Oklahoma City Craigslist page. This one is called Prince Media Pandering. And it says, Prince, you would have thought he was the president the way the media carries on about this non-talented transvestite. Exclamation point. So, transvestite! Every channel went on and on and still are, I say, good riddance. Typical left-wing, pandering media, always pushing their cause. Hell, when Elton John dies, they will probably declare a national holiday for him. They should, because Elton John is a treasure, number one. Uh, number two, mm, you need to check yourself. And third, it's not media pandering. Apparently, it's a pandering media. It's a media that's run by pandas. It's a pandering media. I like that. You don't have to imagine that we're back. Because we are. Might sound crazy. I don't want to alarm you. Do you remember a TV show we used to watch together? It was called... The Pink of Eight? Yeah. Do you watch? Each episode, they help each other fight a new monster from across the county but it's way too scary for most kids. We're gonna defeat him this time. We're gonna need to harness the full potential of our shared powers. Sometimes the pinko paint feels more real than real life. Maybe it was a TV show. Are you sure that's all it was? I like girls, you know that, right? Totally, that's fine. What about you? Do you like girls? I think that I like TV shows. <laughs> it's our destiny. How can I have a destiny? Something's wrong. This is how life is supposed to feel. Tell me you know it's true. Maddie, it's, it's just the suburbs. Seems like you're always somewhere else lately. Like Maddie disappeared without a trace. All they found was her TV set burning in the backyard. I told myself I made the right choice. What if I really was someone else? Very far away on the other side of a television screen.
hot. Pot. On Saturday, the eighth group, what piece of top of paint? Nice cream of corn, one pickle, one slice of Swiss cheese, one slice of salami, one lollipop, one piece of jerry pie, one sausage, one cup of egg, one slice of water. And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Yes, I'm awake. I'm awake. It's time, buddy. It's time. It is time. It is goddamn time. Yes, buddy, my friend who is more than brother to me. I embrace thee. Because it is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film Podcast to electric slide, woogie woogie woogie, our way into the second half of our big shoe. And it is said second half wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our all new digitally remastered director's cut. And now with the long lost alt alternate ending where Charlie Bucket is shot to death by British police. Movie of the week! And this week, we continue our slow march towards our final episode with the look, with a look at the 2024, A24, egg-breaking horror drama, I Saw the TV Glow! Give me some dramatic music, buddy. That was good. Uh, the 2024 A24 egg-breaking horror drama. I saw the TV glow. Funny, do you know what egg-breaking means? What, what breaking? Do you know what egg-breaking means? Uh, make an omelet? No, that's what this movie is all about. So, your gender is an egg. And eventually, the egg cracks, and you realize that you were not the gender that you were given at birth. And so, your gender is an egg. Ogres are onions. Your gender is an egg. And a lot of times, a specific thing will break your egg. Okay. And that's what this movie is about. Because um, my egg started getting cracked when Johnny Depp played Ed Wood. But okay. it was it wasn't until 2019 that I saw Midsommar that that egg got fucking smashed. Yeah. And I now realize that that was the beginning of my road directly towards transitioning because while everyone else saw that movie and was like, man, this is a fucked up movie, I saw uh, Danny, the May Queen, finally being free of the life that she hated and now having a new life with a new family. And I wanted to be the May Queen in Midsommar and get oh, all I of remember. my problems. 
and my gender and put it in that fucking pyramid and set it on fire. And that is what I did. And so that's what this movie is about. Is that it how is you it... see Midsommar now? Yeah. That is fucking yeah. interesting. Midsommar, to me, is a movie about a, a trans woman. And what she does is she, it, Christian represents her. Christian and Danny are the same person. She gets I, rid of I, yeah, Christian. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see where Danny. you're going. Yeah. Go, go on. It's, go exactly, on. it's exactly what I did. I got my gender. Yeah. I put it in a bear. Yeah. I put the bear in a pyramid. I set the pyramid on fire. And now I get to live a happy life as the May Queen. That's what this movie is about. Except for this person, what started the egg cracking was the pink opaque. Yes. So before we which get to is, any of which that. is which is very much based on, or at least has the same vibe in a lot of ways as Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yes, in fact, I looked it up on Wikipedia. The mom of the kid yeah. that it is Tara, is that it? Yeah, From I was Buffy sitting here, I was Square? sitting here watching the movie and I was like, "Holy fuck, is that Tara?" Cuz yeah, now a lot of it, years have gone by. She looks like lot. somebody's mom. Yeah. And yeah, I um, had to go look her up and god damn it, yes it is. Did you look up anybody else who might be in this movie? Uh, no. Not really. <laughs> okay. So, the cameos in I Saw the TV Glow are very set to... They're a part of what the movie is about. So, Tara, who is a lesbian in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, is a mom in this movie. That makes sense. So, I want you to keep this in mind when I tell you that the main character's dad yeah. was played by Fred Durst, the lead singer of Limp Fucking Biscuit. Yeah, I, 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 I briefly saw that. It just didn't, you know, I was just like, yeah, whatever. I didn't, I didn't much care. Yeah, Fred Durst is in this movie. And at first I'm like, what the fuck is Fred Durst doing? But 1996 kind of was his year. Yeah. He he was doing a great job in 96. Not so much now. But anyway, let me do some stats. This is a 2024 movie. It's newish. It it began slowly rolling out in theaters in May, which wasn't that long ago. It was written, produced, and directed by Jane Schoenbrunn. This is her third film after a trippy and little scene film called we're all going to the World's Fair, and a documentary about Slenderman. Okay. In fact, Jane Schopenbrunn is working on a trilogy that she's calling the Screen Trilogy because uh, the movie World's Fair, Let's All Go to the World's Fair, it's about the internet. And okay. that's the first film in the Screen Trilogy. And then I saw the TV glow is about TV, and she the third part of the Screen Trilogy will be a collection of three novels entitled Public Access Afterworld. Okay. And I don't know what that means, but also, I could see Purgatory being a public access television show. You can see what I being feel like public access? I, I might have lost the thread. Um, I could see <laughs> pub, a public access TV show being Purgatory. Oh, okay. It, like, the back rooms seems like the back rooms is where everyone films public access television shows. Yeah. I totally see that. Also, Jane Schoenbrunn is trans femme and non-binary. 
According to Waika Padaya, they realized they were trans after doing shrooms in 2019. And if I may take a short aside here, I, I've i never taken mushrooms. Yeah. I, They're on my bucket I've heard, list. I, I've heard they do wonders for PTSD. Pittist. And I've got a lot of pittist. Yeah. So... I really want to try and get my hands on some. But anyway, um, so let me talk to you about this film, Bunny. Uh, Wikipedia had this to say, okay? I'm going to be reading from Wikipedia here. Okay. Gender identity and dysphoria are prominent themes in Schoenbrunn's work. Uh. They have frequently described I Saw the TV Glow as a film about the egg crack, a term for the moment in a trans person's life when they realize their identity does not correspond to their assigned gender. Additionally, Schoenbrunn has described the presence of screens, which are fe frequently featured in their work as, quote, a metaphor for the ways in which we don't experience ourselves when we're going through dysphoria and coming to terms with transness. And I understand that, especially after, like, I got into Ed Wood so much, I made a religion about him. <coughs> yes, yes, you did. And then I, I, and then it was Midsommar that truly, like, the egg, the cracks began to show with my lifelong obsession with Ed Wood, but the cracking really happened thanks to Midsommar. Um, as a trans person, um, this film was an important film for me because the film is really about being trans and gender dysphoria, gender dysphoria and egg breaking. And sometimes I do get a bad case of gender dysphoria if i'm being real honest i've gotten better now at waking up and looking in the mirror and i just woken up and i took edibles to sleep so i've got cotton mouth like crazy yeah and i haven't shaved and no makeup and my hair's a mess and i look in the mirror and i can see a woman yeah for the longest time, it was, oh, my God, I look like a man. I need to work on making myself into a woman. Now, I'm just a woman. I have reached a comfortable spot in my transition where, and this is an absolute possibility, if tomorrow the fucking assholes in the Republican Party took away all of my medication and stopped me from... uh medically transitioning I'd still be a woman yeah this is just who I am now but uh there there were a number of times where I would look in the mirror my screen my tv glow and I would see my father laughing at me okay especially the first year that I identified as a woman because the first year that I identified as a woman it was all about safety and paranoia and i've got to pass i've got to pass i absolutely yeah. have to pass i'm in the midwest i'm in the bible belt i'm in a small town i'm i am already putting my life on the line by saying i am trans and so i've got to pass i've got to work really hard i gotta watch youtube videos makeup tutorials i've gotta get a bunch of women's clothes more women's clothes a ones that'll make me pass and and i i gotta borrow some clothes from my wife, let's be honest here, uh, steal some clothes from my wife, take some clothes, liberate yes. some clothes from my wife. That's better. And uh, I've got to work on my voice. I've got to work on my feminine voice. I've got to tilt my head a little more than I normally do because a lot of women do that. I got to start playing with my hair more. I got to be more gesture more with my hands. I've got to pay attention to how women dress, how women walk. I need to pass, I need to pass, I need to pass. But now, though, three years into my transition, like, 
I've never really been attacked. I've never really, like, I'm fine. I feel like I'd be attacked more if I still lived in California. Yeah. But I'm fine, and I'm out as a trans woman, and everybody knows it, and I'm fine with it. But there were parts of this film that spoke very deeply to me. Yeah, where? As a trans Tell me, woman. tell me. Educate me here. I love this uh, movie. But now, from my perspective, like, I don't know when it dawned on me that he was a trans woman, but it did. And it did. I found the... it all very subtle leading up to that point, where it sounded yeah. like you didn't find it damn near as subtle. No, fuck no. The when he's doing the parachute at school, it's the trans colors. It's a trans flag. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, so, that missed. But, yeah, I didn't yeah. get that bit. Yeah, it's an actual trans flag, and everyone's just sitting there and they're playing. But he's the one who like stands up and he's looking and he walks into the middle of it, and you see the trans colors right there. Then there's the fact that, like, oh, like every A24 film, this is, like, neon to death. But mostly he is in blue. Yeah. Because, you know, the whole film is about his egg. And, yeah, I, I understood, hey, here's this thing. Here's this piece of media. Here's this piece of pop culture in some way. And I want to get into it. But also, I'm scared of my dad. Yeah. Who is, who, he, my father was very strict on, um, he was really into beating cishet heteronormativity into me. So I understood the fear. When I was like in junior high and high school, I would go to the mall, steal cassette singles, cas singles as they were called. From female artists, because I know I can't ask my parents for money to buy music from a female artist, because female artists, they're for girls, and I'm a guy, and so I can't listen to it. So I would get, <clears throat> like, I would take, like, Madonna, um, Wilson Phillips, Paula Abdul, and then I'd wait for my family to be gone, my parents to be gone. I would lock the door, and I would listen to uh, music by women and I would dance so I absolutely understand like oh this show I want to watch it but I know I cannot and the dad says isn't that a show for girls I yeah. 100% know that I get that I understand that and I I don't think I would have gotten um, realizing gender through a medium of pop culture is it if it wasn't for the fact that now I'm on the other side and I'm trans and oh yeah, Midsommar did that for me. Yeah. Midsommar was my pink opaque. This film is a direct allegory to trans identity without ever actually fucking saying it. And I really like it, but here's the thing, Bunny, real talk. Honest uh, confession time. Hello, my name is May Lynn. I have never seen an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Seriously? Ever. Never saw it. I saw the original movie with Christy Swanson. Yeah. And I thought that it was kind of fun, but no, I never saw... I never saw Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And when I was talking to my wife about this movie, she said, so you never saw Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Why didn't you see it back then? And it's like, it was popular. And everybody yeah. loved it. So I pushed it away from me. Yeah. And also, I felt like it was for girls. So fucking, I might have to start watching Buffy. You might have I'm a to. little bit late. It, it, to the... TV now and TV shows now 
are really more about myth building and carrying a particular theme throughout a whole season. Yeah. And it makes TV now much more interesting, I think, but not nearly as rewatchable. Yeah. You know, older shows like Star Trek, you could watch the fucking Troubles for Tribbles for the rest of your fucking life. You know what I mean? Yeah, I saw some article online, and I don't remember where I saw it, but um, it basically was talking about how now that every TV show has a season comprising of six episodes that will take like two years to make. Yeah. Um, no longer are there filler episodes. Yeah. Back when you had 24 episodes to do, so one of them, someone's stuck in a fucking elevator. Yeah. But from one how... of them, clip show. Yeah. But from how, how I see this, it seemed to have transitioned at the same po- at the same point with both the X Files and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, starting yeah. as a regular, uh, you know, monster of the week kind of a thing, yeah. you know, like the beginning of Supernatural was the same way, right? And then as you get seasons into it, now it is more. Lore. Episodic and lore and their myth and yeah. And it's Yeah, that's it's what I was thinking when better, I was talking to but not as rewatchable, I find. Yeah. When I was talking to Natasha about maybe finally watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer, one of the things that got me was I don't know if I can get through the first three seasons where there's no lore. Where it's just monster of the week, and then eventually they get to like the characterization and lore and world building and all that. Well, well, no, there's character building, of course. You know. Just like on any other show. But, come on. Remember when when... Slender Man comes from Buffy. Watch the Gentleman episode. You know what I think is the problem with America? There are no more musical episodes. Buffy had a musical episode? Yep, Buffy had a musical episode. Scrubs had a musical episode. Uh, TV but shows need to. to the movie. Where, where's the Breaking Bad musical episode? I would have watched the shit out of that. Back to the movie. What else did you see? Does House have a musical episode? You don't know? Okay. Um, this film is set in 1996. Oh, Funny. and even it, it, back to the movie though. Even that yeah. that bar that they met in later, yeah, where we found out she worked at Build a Bear, like Hot Topics wasn't fucking hiring. But anyway, that was more or less the bronze from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the club that they all hung out as. Right. You know, so they, they were all, so like maybe they did that for the rest of us. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> So, um, funny. This uh, a good portion of this film was set in 1996, and funny, you know, a lot happened in the year 1996. Let's talk about it. What was the top movie of the year? Ninety-six. You'll never guess it. Fighting too hard to survive. We were in Binghamton at the time. Let me tell you what the top movie of the year 1996 was. Of course, America had Mary Riley fever. Everyone loved Mary Riley. You'd see people lining up and seeing it like five or six times in a row. America was Mary Riley obsessed. Now, the biggest bomb of the year, Independence Day. You mean to tell me that this is an alien movie starring the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Taxi's Judd Hirsch? Yeah. Nobody saw Independence Day. It, everyone had Mary Riley people. Um, Braveheart won Oscars. 
And of course, in Mel Gibson's acceptance speech for Best Picture and Best Director, he famously said, I'd like to thank all of the Jews in my life yeah. for whom I'll never have an issue with. Yes. Ever. You know who time you know who People magazine's hottest man, sexiest man alive was in 1996? Of course you do. Ted Kaczynski. Okay. He really exploded onto the scene in 96. He had a real uh cottage core vibe. Well, you it. know, it's it's the air of mystery, you know, like yeah. You see all the sketches of him with the hoodie and it's closed down over his face and he can barely, you, you, you just, you just can't help but thinking like, man, what's Mystique. under that hood? Exactly. What exactly. are we going to, what are we going to see once we pull that foreskin back? <laughs> in the year 1996, Jim Carrey was paid $20 million to star in the movie, The Cable Guy. And I'm just going to be really honest. I still don't know why. I there's a movie I've yet to see. Hey, I've never been that big. Of, never been that big of a fan. Oh, the no, only thing Carrey that I like. The only thing I liked about the Cable Guy is that Jim Carrey, in his Jim Carreyist, sang a cover of the song "Somebody to Love." Okay. And anytime I hear that song, I think of Jim Carrey and the Cable Guy. But beyond that, I don't give a shit. And of course, the biggest news of 1996 was uh, the tragic news that we all remember when uh, rapper Tupac Shakur was murdered by police after killing John Benet Ramsey. Yeah. They had a long beat, you know, because. Tupac was East Coast. John Benet Ramsey, she was doing uh, beauty pageants in the West Coast, so yeah. it really was an East Coast West Coast sort of thing. Anyway, John Benet Ramsey released a diss track. Tupac killed her, and then Tupac was killed by the police, and then they covered it up. It's very sad. Uh, and also in 1996, I had just started college, and here's a fun fact. Here's a fun fact. Uh, I was going to Arizona State University, which is in Tempe, Arizona. It's right there on Mill Avenue. Mill Avenue and University Avenue were like the centers of the college, and they had coffee shops and, you know, uh, uh, drug paraphernalia places and just cool places where you could get some food, and there were nightclubs and you could hang out. And there was a big movie theater, a Harkins movie theater. And I spent so much time there in 94 and 95 and 96 and 97 and 98 and 99. I spent so much time at that one specific Harkins movie theater on Mill Avenue. You know who worked there at the time? Ten minute warning. You know who worked there at the time? Who? A young Bill Hader. Stefan from SNL. He worked at that uh, Harkins movie theater in 95 and 96 and 97. He was fired in 1997 after ruining the ending of the movie Titanic for a bunch of sorority girls. Okay. That's true. So I spent so much time at that movie theater in Tempe, Arizona, that there is no way that I did not run into Bill Hader. Yeah. That's really weird to me. They're like, holy shit. There is a there is a 95% chance that at one point in time, Stefan served me popcorn. Yeah, yeah. That's fucking insane. So anyway, Bunny, uh, this week's movie did have me at age 24, but besides that, I was fresh out of high school in 1996. At the time, I was regularly dressing as a woman, and I had to hide it because my dad was really into beating uh, cishet heteronormativity into me. I understand the fear yeah. that 
the lead character of this week's movie felt about. Um, honestly, I really related to this film. At times, it felt like I was painfully watching embarrassing home videos of myself. Okay. All trans people have parts of their life like this, I honestly believe. Where the the thing that that touched me the most, number one, the finale, but we'll get to that. And number two, this movie does a great job of showing how it felt before I transitioned. Yeah. An isolation and a fear. And knowing that that something is wrong with you, but you don't know what's wrong with you, and neither does anybody else. And so you find yourself in a position where you're not living your life. Your life is kind of being lived for you, and you're watching it. And you don't realize it, but you have created a persona to sort of get you through existence. And you're not so much being yourself as you're playing a part, but you won't know that until the egg finally cracks and you get onto the other side. But I fully understood what it felt to sort of find yourself in bits of pop culture. And that's why this is all about the egg break. And it really uh, touched me in that way. You don't realize that you are not you. Yeah. And uh, six minutes. Okay. Mm. Also, Connor O'Malley is in this. He's his boss at like the family well, I mean, fun but center. That's the part. Sorry. But, and the, he but was that's in, the part and, that I, I can't relate to. You know what I mean? Like, because yeah. I've just never had anything in my experience like that. This is me, good or worse. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No. I, it, yeah. I, I don't look like I'm hiding both, shit. <laughs> both Q and I saw this. Both Q and I, before we saw this movie together, we saw reviews. I saw reviews of I saw the TV globe by like straight white people saying, I just want to give all trans people a hug. I get it now. I understand. But I didn't see that at all. When I saw this film, I said, okay, this film will really say something to trans people, but for everyone else, yeah. I hope they like it. Not nearly as much. Right. It, for for, yeah. for non-trans people, not nearly as much. That's why, that's why I, I want to hear more about what you say about the movie for all the weird little shit like the egg breaking or the glow of the TV that uh, that went right by me. Yeah. Um, I'm sure a lot of I, this movie went right by me, but it was and still I a very understand. enjoyable A24 road to go down. Yeah. I had to bury myself in order for me to live. So yeah. I understood the whole, here is this person, and this person knows that you are different, so come with me, and I will help you, and I will bring you there, and eventually he's just too scared. And that I really related to, because I was scared to medically transition, and then something happened to me at the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022, which caused me to say, hey, now that I've survived this horrible thing, I'm not scared of a lot of things, and I started transitioning, and I feel so much different than I did before. And so I absolutely understood, hey, I buried myself underground and came back out, and it was a struggle, but now I'm better for it. Yeah. And he's scared of it. The biggest thing, it, the ending scared the shit out of me. Because a number of times... As Mei Lin, as the trans woman that I am, I have visited Barnes & Noble bookstores, and I have gone in and heard the music and seen the displays and looked at the employees and said, this is the most boring fucking job in the fucking world. 
And there is no way that I could stay here as a trans woman. So seeing him too scared to transition, staying who he pretends to be, and being stuck 40-something years old, still working at the uh, family amusement center. Yeah. I do not want to see myself as a 50-year-old man covering nine at the bookstore. Yeah. That ending scared the shit out of me. And I it 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 really talked to me specifically because I had to bury myself in order for me to live. Going from Steve to Mei Lin in the 10 years that we have done this show, the best way that I can describe it is what fucking Brad Pitt goes through an interview with a vampire. You're living your life, your life is okay. But it's not until you get bitten and you look at things with vampire eyes that you realize, oh my god, yeah, this is actually amazing. So you have to have the courage. Uh, the egg breaks, and then what are you going to do with it? So you've got to put it together, and I made an omelet. Yeah. And if you'd like to learn more about egg breaking... Just watch this week's movie. I saw the TV glow from yeah. 2024. And, and it, I it also, does a great job. I also walked into this just dead cold. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, all I knew was the name of the movie, and it was an A24 movie. And frankly, that's all you really need to know. At first, when I was watching the movie, I'm like, okay, so it's 1996. Okay. How am I supposed to know it's 1996? Why don't you, the film, show me it's 1996? Because I don't see anything here that is different from, holy shit, that's a Fruitopia vending machine. <laughs> we are in 1996, people. Fruitopia. <laughs> so that was good. Also, Fred Durst is in this. And this speaks directly to trans people in an amazing way. But that's all I've got for this week's film. I love it. It's going to be on my list of my favorite movies of the year. And we have been talking a lot about gender and gender identity. And I have one more week to pick movies. And so I am doing my last ever double feature. We are continuing this week's discussion in the next episode where we will be watching and discussing Ed Wood and Midsommar. Oh, we're going to rewatch them both, okay? Yes. And it's going to be about more about my gender identity than about Ed Wood and Midsommar, but we'll have fun. So that's the next episode. Now that I'm looking back at this episode, the highs, the lows, the ups, the downs, Fred Durst, uh, the Star Wars candy where you made out with Jar Jar Vase, Sacramentos, Las Palmas, Johnny Rockets. I got to say, I think this has been a pretty good episode of podcast. It has been a damn good episode. Okay, I I concur with your assessment 